Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I'm Florida State Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith, and I represent Florida House District 49 in East Orlando, which is East Orange County. Uh, and welcome to another one of our community conversations on the importance of home rule and the importance of local solutions. Today, I want to talk about really the dynamic between state and local governments on probably a number of issues. Uh, as you know, I'm a state representative and I've been serving in Florida uh, House District 49 since 2016. And during that time uh, in Tallahassee as a lawmaker, I've seen a lot of attacks on home rule and attacks on local freedom. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, constituents and voters elect local leaders to our cities and counties to enact policies that reflect your values, our values, uh, to strengthen your local economies, to create the conditions for individuals and families to succeed and to flourish. Our local elected officials, our mayors and our city council persons, they are accountable to their local voters. That's because our mayors and city council persons, they're typically our neighbors. They're the folks that we run into at the grocery store, or in the school pickup line. So you're often finding them out in the community so that you can have their ear on the topics that matter to you most. Now, I think that that's a good thing. Uh, and home rule, you know, a lot of people kind of wonder what is home rule and what is local control and what does that mean? Well, home rule is the ability of local elected leaders to make local decisions that best reflect the unique needs of their community. So, you know, we know that in many ways we have seen Tallahassee has continued to pass preemption laws, meaning they're passing laws to limit local policy making, taking power away from those same constituents who elect our mayors and city council people to set those local policies. More often than not, our state lawmakers are abusing preemption at the behest of their corporate donors. And at the end of the day, our local communities lose their power to big government. If you don't like big government, which I know a lot of my conservative friends don't, it's easy to see um, stopping big state government from interfering in local decisions and local affairs as really being essential to uh, ensuring our families and communities can prosper. Uh, one more fact I wanted to bring you before we start our discussion is the Florida League of Cities uh, has identified nearly 100 legislative preemptions passed into law attacking local control and local decision making between 2010 and 2021. I think this is a dangerous precedent that undermines our local freedoms, but don't just take my word for it. Uh, I've got two guests joining us today to discuss this uh, and how state and local governments can actually work together to solve problems as opposed to create them, which sometimes is what the outcome is. This is a bipartisan conversation that I'm really, really excited about. So first I wanna welcome the mayor of Oviedo, Mayor Megan Sladek. Okay, there she is. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. Well, Mayor Sladek, Megan Sladek was elected mayor of the city of Oviedo in Seminole County uh, in 2019. She's helped the city of Oviedo lower its debt, worked with regional organizations to bring transportation solutions to the city, and worked in collaboration with UCF to help bring high paying jobs home to Oviedo. Mayor Sladek leads with respect for all, and I'm glad to have her here today. <laughs> glad to be here. And I also love the hashtag that you always use, which I like to steal on social media, hashtag love Oviedo. I, like uh, I like to use that uh, <laughs> even in my social media. So thank you for being here, Megan. It's really cool to have you. Also joining us uh, today is the mayor of Longwood. Uh, mayor Matt Morgan was elected in 2019, also, I believe, the same year that Mayor Sladek was uh, elected. And since then, I, I think he, I think he's here with us. I hope he turns on his camera. Uh, Mayor Morgan, there he is. Yeah, there we go. Since he was elected, he has worked to bring small businesses to Longwood. Uh, he's passionate about being a voice for the voiceless in his community, aiming to turn the city into a thriving, family-friendly place. He's worked to improve law enforcement and find ways to engage his community with local government. 
Also, fun fact, he also is a former WWE superstar <laughs> and definitely is the biggest mayor in Seminole County. So uh, super cool to have you the here. Whole here country. He's you. the official tallest in the whole country. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Again, to being the world's tallest short person, though, isn't it really after, at the end of the day? <laughs> <laughs> so thank, thank you both for joining us. I think, first of all, uh, just want to point out that it's super cool for me, uh, an elected state Democrat, to have a conversation about home rule and really about anything with two local Republican mayors. I know that you uh, run in nonpartisan races, but you're pretty well-known Republicans in the area. And I think that bipartisan conversations are super important. But I also opened this whole discussion with like my diatribe on the importance of home rule and stopping Tallahassee preemption. I want to hear from you both. How do you how do you feel about home rule generally? And I'm hoping maybe you can tell me if you think I got something wrong about this preemption trend. I mean, what's your take on this? Whoever wants to jump in. Well, I, I, I got some thoughts. Uh, generally speaking, when I agree with my colleagues, I love home rule. When I think they have gone a, the wrong direction, I think state, please help us out and preempt what these guys have done. And I, I think that probably applies to everybody. <laughs> but there are times- when, At least you're honest about it, Mary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think there are times when it, <laughs> it, it can be helpful for the state to remove tools from our toolbox, because sometimes at the local level, you know, we're, we're all part-time. Uh, sometimes we, we do not skillfully wield some of the tools that have been given to us. Well said. Interesting. Very what well about said. you, Mayor Morgan? That was very well said. Um, I just, again, at the end of the day, and not sound like a bumper sticker or anything you said it earlier, I really do believe I was elected along with my four other commissioners to be the voice of the voices, to be everybody's conduit. So like everybody says, vote, uh, you know, elections have consequences. And those of us that were elected to our city responsibilities or elected roles, we do take on the, uh, um, you know, of being able to represent those residents and the things that they want to see done. And uh, sometimes, yeah, like Megan says, you'll be stuck in scenarios where Maybe you're outvoted three to two, four to one by your fellow commissioners on certain issues um, that you, you, Megan said, sometimes you wish the state would come in and, and, and do something at times, right, to override it or whatever have you. But ultimately, I don't know, it, it, I think I'm always going to be for smaller government, obviously. Um, and just the fact that you're even doing this is pretty cool, I think. The fact that you're a state representative. Um, we've had others, David Smith is one of them as well, that, that are willing to sit down a lot with many of us in city government and say, hey, look, I don't live here. You do. Tell me what you need. What can we do to help? Like what you're doing right now, which again, I'm incredibly grateful for. Seriously. Thank you, Mayor Morgan. You know, one thing that I want to mention, even though I didn't, uh, you know, I, I think that there's a little bit of disagreement on the role of preemption. I want to use an example that I was struggling with this year. So this year, um, there was a bill, Senate Bill 620 in Tallahassee, that basically gave um, private businesses who've been operating a legal business in the jurisdiction for at least three years, the right to sue their local government uh, if an ordinance was passed or a charter provision was passed, which caused the business to allegedly lose at least 15% of their profits. Now, the stated purpose of this cause of action was so that, I guess, local governments would not be incentivized and they would be dissuaded from passing ordinances that impact businesses. But it was kind of driven by the puppy mill industry. A lot of cities and counties have uh, rightfully, in my opinion, passed ordinances to uh, to to regulate what puppy mills are doing for the betterment of our animals and our pets. Uh, and they were kind of behind that preemption in a way that this law, when passed, would have canceled any uh, ordinances and regulations locally passed on puppy mills. So I voted against the bill, and I was glad to yeah. see... <laughs> some right. I, I was glad to see a, a rare moment in some bipartisanship because Governor DeSantis 
vetoed the bill. He vetoed it and it did not become law, even though it passed the Florida legislature. That's one example of what Tallahassee often does at the behest of corporate donors to try to interfere in local government and local uh, policymaking. But I'm curious if maybe either one of you have uh, examples of how Tallahassee preemption has kind of gotten in the way of how you're responsive or trying to be responsive to your constituents and your community needs. Let me take, just take a look real quick. I just want to piggyback on that. So another example, if that had passed, is what happens, us, we as cities, we could have been sued. And so imagine if somebody just puts it out there saying, hey, I don't like your sign ordinance because I'm not able to have this X, Y, and C light up neon sign in front of my business. We feel we lost business because of it. We're suing you now, city of Longwood. Like it, it could have been broken down to even that level. That's how insane that bill was. So good for you, good for governor, and uh, we appreciate you. I'm gonna pass this over to Megan because I know Megan has a good answer on this one. <laughs> All right, so my number one pet peeve is there is pet a- Pet peeve. Pet peeve. <laughs> oh, that's bust. That is an ironic word. You say. <laughs> so there is a state level statute that says that cities must pick places to increase density in their comp plans, whatever they redo them, whether they like it or not. And uh, when, when we just redid our comprehensive plan, I was like, no, nah, we, we have to have as a choice to stop growing. That has to be a choice. Uh, and, and, I, and I looked at, at staff and I said, you need to prove it. If you don't show me the statute, like, I just don't believe you. And they showed me the statute and I've been popping it all over social media the best I can because I can't believe that it's there. And the more I think about it, the more I think, well, you know, it, unless we're going to regulate birth rates, how else do we address the natural increase in population? So it, it's one of those double-edged swords, like thanks kind of in a way state for telling us we have to, to accept density, but why don't y'all just go to be a little more vocal and say, it's our idea. We're making these cities take on more growth, please. <laughs> Well, that, that's a, that's an interesting take. I know that you have, uh, Megan, uh, Mayor Sladek, excuse me, I know that you have a lot of uh, ideas around housing affordability, around zoning reform. And, you know, I think a, lo a lot of the housing and zoning reforms that need to happen to create more housing supply certainly need to ha happen at the local level. But sometimes our cities and counties are hamstrung. They're not really given the opportunity to do that, or maybe sometimes need more incentives to do it. I, I read an op-ed from you recently uh, that you wrote in the Orlando Sentinel, uh, Mayor Sladek, and it was talking a lot about how we can kind of reform zoning, particularly for duplexes. And you had a lot of other interesting ideas in there. Many of them I agreed with. I guess my question is, what do you think the state legislature can do to encourage cities to engage in smart growth and, and also kind of tackle uh, inclusionary zoning to get more of those units? Because we have a sum supply and demand problem in Florida as far as affordable housing, and there's a lot of way to get those units. Yes, construction is part of it, but also zoning reform can be part of it too, right? Oh, absolutely. So we have a lot of arbitrary rules at the local level that require you to have a certain minimum amount of land or a certain minimum size of building on that piece of land. So that artificially inflates the, the or, or, it artificially constricts the amount of housing that can be built because instead of saying, well, look, you've got a lot, you can have, you know, four units that take up 3,000 square feet, they're regulating the number of families that can live there. So with the minimalism going on in some of our, our younger people, my, my daughter wants to live in the tiniest house she can find. Uh, it's illegal to build a home that's small enough for her to want to live in it, and let alone afford it. So things like that, like to perhaps remove some of these discretions from, you know, take that tool out of the toolbox of the locals and say, look, you can regulate setbacks, height, what it looks like from the outside, parking, noise. You can regulate everything except the number of people who live in that house. Because what's it to you? If, if I choose to live in a smaller home, I, I don't know that I, I should be required to live in a big house on a big piece of land. 
I understand what you mean. And I, I, I read through that op-ed and I thought it was, uh, I thought it had a lot of really, really good ideas in it. I know that you trashed some of the ideas that I kind of like, <laughs> like <laughs> rent stabilization, for example. And, you know, I think what I would say, and obviously this would not be an authentic bipartisan conversation if there wasn't uh, some disagreement here, is that, you know, my overall philosophy on trying to address the housing affordability solution is that we need to put like a lot of options and a lot of tools on the table. For example, I support the rent stabilization ordinance that's on the ballot in Orange County. I know that's not in Seminole, not because I believe a rent stabilization is going to solve all of our problems, but because I feel like it is just one part of the puzzle in trying to at least give some relief to some of these families that are seeing these increasing rents. But what we also have to do is we have to create more supply. We need to figure something out at the state level, probably about a lot of the investors that are coming in and buying up neighbor, buying up houses and neighborhoods, single family homes, and pricing people out of being able to buy a house. I know we've seen this in Oviedo and other places where, you know, folks save up for a long time to live the American dream and finally buy their first, first house. House goes on the market. They can, they know they can afford the mortgage and the an investor swoops in, offers fifty thousand dollars cash over the asking price, and that family is out of luck. And what are they doing when they buy that house? The investor, the investor just rents it out at the highest rent possible to rent gouge some other family, and it perpetuates the problem. But you've you've brought but forward. They could have bought it. I mean, that that's the thing with the free market is the neighbors could have bought it. If somebody else had 50,000 more, they could have bought it, but we have created a situation where everybody treats their home as an investment vehicle. So now Blackstone and all these groups are, are treating it as an investment vehicle too. So you, you can't have it both ways. So when all of the single family homeowners fuss about constricting the supply, that makes the value go higher, which makes Blackstone and all these investment groups realize that they have all of us protecting and increasing the artificially increasing the value of whatever it is they buy. So it, it, there is an opportunity, I think, for the state to, to tinker with maybe in, uh, interest rates of tax deed sales uh, or you know, tax certificate sales. And, and when it goes to the point of tax deed sale, tinker with the maximum rate that, that can be earned to make it less attractive for these out of, out of state investment groups to come in and just scoop the whole neighborhood up who also if i can representative smith who also, who also they have nine out of ten times right the inside track on all of this stuff to begin with more than joe blow my neighbor for example uh, or, or whatnot than the normal everyday resident does on that inside track if you will on these homes that are being put on the market it's these people's job to know that and i'm not saying that to poo poo on every single developer but that's that's the truth so um, that's, it's a tough call. Here, here's what I say at the end of the day here in Longwood. I really believe what I just said earlier. Um, my job is to carry out literally what our residents want. That ain't the, that's not my seat that I sit in on that dais. That's theirs. I'm renting it for four years until they see somebody that they want to put there instead of me. Um, I really believe that's our role as a city elected official. And leave it up to your residents on the things that they want to see. We started streaming all of our commission meetings on Facebook Live. We're the first in the Southeast region to start doing it. And I get that kind of feedback hundreds up to thousands of times, legit a month on the things our residents want to see because they're a part of every bit of our processes and our policies that are coming through. But like what Megan's talking about, she's thinking into the future, which is smart, obviously, and she's doing her due diligence in what her residents there want. Um, different cities, different strokes for different folks, if, if I will. You know what I mean? And uh, I just always try to keep my mind on that first and foremost. So here in our Absolutely. city, call us a modern day Mayberry because we're proud to be a small city. That that works for us. Other cities are different. Even though Seminole County is so small as a county, the cities, even though we're all neighbors and brothers and sisters is as far as they can go, but we are all different in what some of our voters want. Which is why home rule is 
so so important uh important in uh, in every circumstance uh and i know that you know sometimes there's a little bit of a back and forth here on how much home rule is too much home rule i am definitely a home rule kind of guy so uh usually when i hear the word preemption uh i kind of turns into a dirty word for me and i don't like it you know, obviously the state creates laws for everyone to follow in all parts of the state, but usually when it comes to things that counties and cities should be doing, the state should be setting the floor, so to speak, the floor uh, on which the cities and counties then build on if they want to do more than the floor that's been set in the statewide law, as opposed to what they do now, which is oftentimes just pulling the floor out from under you. <laughs> And, and saying that you can't do certain things or can't pass certain ordinances. And back to that. I don't mind that. <laughs> right. right. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I forgot. Mayor Sladek <laughs> said that she she likes preemption when the preemption okay. goes goes her way. <laughs> and she and she likes home rule when everyone agrees with her in, in city commission. So <laughs> that's good. To, that's good to know. Good to know. You I know, think that's how everybody is. And, and if we could all talk in more honest terms, it would be so much easier. <laughs> Well, I have introduced legislation, for example, to try to get rid of some of the uh, preemptions, particularly there is a state preemption right now on the ability of local cities and counties to be able to set a minimum wage uh, and uh, set specific minimum benefits. That was something that was uh, preempted by Tallahassee. And while we now have a $15 minimum wage in Florida statewide, at least we're getting to that $1 extra per year, uh, the cost of living is going up in a lot of areas of the state more than it is in others. So having that ability for local governments to potentially be able to make that type of local decision, I think is really, really important. And then there's another law that I would like to see. Oh, I got to just chime in real quickly. This will. Oh, never, I knew you weren't going to like that. This will never happen in Oviedo. <laughs> there's no interest in, in setting minimum wage, uh, you know, hi, making it higher in Oviedo. <laughs> Let's okay, well, now that we know that, that for the record. <laughs> Okay, there, yeah, there, carry on, carry on. There's another law that was passed in 2019, House Bill 7103, which actually requires, this is the housing thing, requires local governments to somehow compensate developers when local governments have adopted ordinances that require some affordable housing. I don't think that that has worked out very well. Oh, and we, well, I, I got to interrupt again. Okay, so we were talking about that. That's the linkage fee thing. Okay, Matt, you're going to be like, your brain's going to explode in the most beautiful way. So in 2020, the state legislature passed a law that we are allowed to create an impact fee for affordable housing. It's called a linkage fee. And you can charge it to uh, my understanding, and I got to double check this on, you know, here we are on Facebook Live. Uh, my understanding is luxury apartments and commercial all you, you can prove a dual rational nexus to charge them a fee for jobs created that are low earning jobs that pull people to their area where there is no affordable place to live. In Oviedo, this is a really big deal because it's not, you can't afford to live here. Uh, the, the housing market here is worse, I think, than any, or any other place in Seminole County. So if we have a restaurant open and they're paying, what is it now, 13 bucks an hour maybe, or 15 if you're lucky you can't afford to live here on 15 an hour. So we could, if somebody planned to open space that would have the, create those kind of jobs, charge a fee that could then be given to the Seminole County Housing Authority to allow them to help offset the rent of people who may work there. And the compensation, because it's a Republican legislature, they said, well, you got to pay them for it. And, and the way we're allowed to pay them is by getting density bonuses. Oviedo already offers density bonuses, but why would anyone take a density bonus when it costs so much to go higher than three or four stories? You're, you're, it's cheaper for them to just do three stories, four stories, call it a day. But if you have to pay something in exchange, well, then you can look and it changes the math a little bit. And you say, well, do I, do I want to go an extra story and create 20% affordable housing? Or do I want to pay a linkage fee and help address the problem in that way? So anyway, that food for thought for later. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Listen, it is already, we're more than 20 minutes into this discussion. We knew it was going to be 
short but sweet. But at the end of the day, the point of this discussion was just talking about the importance of home rule, knowing what the implications are of preemption abuses, but also just making sure that our state and local government leaders work together in tandem so that we can really help the betterment of all of our communities. We may not see eye to eye on everything, that's for sure. But as you know, I've been the type of state representative for six years that is always making sure that we're having these conversations locally, talking about how these laws in Tallahassee impact our uh, local communities and our city and county governments, and that will never change. So uh, I'm just really appreciative of the two of you uh, joining this very short discussion and kind of want to kick it to each one if you have any closing thoughts for us. If I can, just real quick, I just want to say thank you because I hope it doesn't sound like a promo or a talking point here. It's the truth. I mean this from my heart. We're at a time right now in our country, forget our county and state, where we're the most divisive we've ever, 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 ever been. And uh, we need more commonalities to talk about with one another on both sides of the aisle. Even though Megan and I may not be state house representatives and we're mayors in each of our city, um, I, I hope I'm speaking for Megan here. I'm sure I am. Um, we're, we're very uh, uh, honored and blessed that you're willing to have conversations with, uh, it goes without saying, obviously, when you introduce us as conservatives and you're a Democrat, right? Everybody immediately knows, well, they're in their bo this box. He must be in this box then, right? <laughs> Boxes that they're only thickening and thickening more and more and more as each day goes by. In my opinion, our job, if we're doing our duly response, elected responsibilities, we're supposed to represent everybody. doesn't matter what, what race, what religion, uh, that crap. We're not supposed to care about any of that. We're supposed to represent every single one of our constituents, no matter what their political background is, the same and, and then fairly. So the more like-minded conversations where we're able to talk publicly about the things we do have in common, I think the better the better this country is going to be. And I, again, applaud you for being willing to talk to two conservatives. Thank you, brother. Thank you as well, Mayor Morgan. Mayor Sladek, any closing Thank thoughts? You. Ditto on that. You're awfully brave to, to let me come on here because I have no brain to <laughs> tech. And thank you for the opportunity to have this really candid conversation. I think it's been a good one. Out, yeah, out of control conversation it was, totally <laughs> off the rails. No, actually, I really enjoyed this. Uh, I thought that this was really great. And actually, it seemed a lot like uh, the conversations that we have face to face. So I uh, hope people felt like this was uh, an authentic, organic conversation, because it really was. And I appreciate both Mayor Megan Sladek of Oviedo and Mayor Matt Morgan of Longwood for joining us for this community conversation. And I hope you all have a good Friday and enjoy your weekend as well. We'll be in touch. Thank you all.